The following is a production of the Leonine Institute for Catholic Social Teaching. For more information, please visit leoinstitute.org. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Houck, and this topic is understanding the natural law. So let's begin with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, please send your Holy Spirit to illumine our hearts, minds, and soul for clarity that we may grow ever intimate with the Holy Trinity. Amen. St. Matthew. St. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So this is a special night uh, because, as you know, Matthew was named Levi, and uh, today is Levi's feast day. Well, it wasn't planned that way, um, but we've created a feast day. So to talk about the natural law, we're going to talk about it in two parts. The bigger part is to have a correct concept of what man is. So there's no sense in talking about natural law if we don't have a working concept of the human being. So um, what I'd like to do is to help us on the track of a properly ordered concept of man, is I want to read two paragraphs from the foreword of this book. Becoming a human being involves more than conception and birth. It is a mandate and a mission, a command and a decision. A human being has an open-ended relationship to himself. He does not possess his being unchallenged. He cannot take his being for granted as God does, nor does he possess it in the same way as other creatures around him. Other animals, for example, survive in mute innocence and cramped necessity with no future horizons. They are what they are from the start. The law of their life and being is spelled out for them, and they resign themselves to these limits without question. Man, however, is challenged and questioned from the depths of his boundless spirit. Being is entrusted to him as a summons, which he is to accept and consciously acknowledge. He is never simply a being that is there and ready-made, just for the asking. From the very start, he is something that can be a being who must win his selfhood and decide what he is to be. He must fully become what he is, a human being. To become man through the exercise of his freedom, that is the law of man's being. So let's talk about what we have in common with animals, with beasts. We have two things. And I'm afraid I can't cite the reference, but it's a very good reference because it has a lasting impression on me. But you can ask for yourself or answer for yourself. Man and beast share survival instinct. Man and beast share the procreative instinct. These are good. They can be problematic, but they're good, and they're properly ordered to nature. Sidebar. I love sidebars. Sidebar. There's a reason why in our liturgical calendar we acknowledge saints like popes, abbots, priests, deacons, Ephraim, bishops. But we also, in the liturgical calendar, acknowledge martyrs and virgins. Are we clear? Those are things where people have gone extraordinary. This doesn't necessarily mean the survival instinct and the procreative instinct are bad. It's that those are ordinary. 
martyrs and virgins are called to the extraordinary. But you'll notice that they relate right back to those two commonalities with beast. But there's more. Man also, where beast stops, Genesis 1, 26, Genesis 1, 27. Man is made in the image of God. Now you've heard image and likeness. We're not going to talk about translations. Dare I get into translation wars? No. What I want to say, though, is the early church fathers commented on Genesis 126 and 127 more than any other passage in Genesis. What I'd like to leave you with, which is a very scholarly understanding, and not get into all the image and likeness, but we're going to focus on image, not likeness. Likeness is generally understood as the perfection of what it means because we're working out our being, like I just read in the foreword. We're going to focus on the image of God. And that is described as three things. Reason, will, and authority. So we're in this strange tension between beast and God, where we share nature with beasts, we share nature with God. And so the foreword I just read you, I'm going to read you again. You thought I was bad in the classroom, repeating myself. <laughs> There's no escape from the Haug repetition. Second paragraph. Man, however, is challenged and questioned from the depths of his boundless spirit. Being is entrusted to him as a summons which he is to accept and consciously acknowledge. He is never simply a being that is there and ready-made, precisely, just for the asking. From the very start, he is something that can be. Sidebar, working out the tensions, the part beast, part image of God. A being who must win his selfhood and decide what he is to be. He must fully become what he is, a human being. To become man through the exercise of his freedom, that is the law of his being. That's part of the concept of man. But now we're going to talk about the doing that's involved in the being. And what does that look like? So, we all have a vague notion of what ethics are. But when it gets right down to it, the Greeks have given us what we need to know. It's simply, what ought you do? It's an imperative. Ethics are nothing more than imperatives. You may quibble over where they're derived, as a lawyer, it's imperative. Can I walk around, Levi? Yeah, um, as a lawyer, it's imperative. No matter what, even if I meant to do right by my client, to share anything that is privileged with anyone else. That's an imperative. I might not like it, but if I do that, I'm disbarred. And that's right, so it's an imperative. We call it lawyer ethics. We have medical ethics. Ethics are what you ought to do. Along comes Cicero, he translates it as manners, what we know as manners, but the Latin is M-O-R-E-S, the word morality. So a moral code is also an ethical code. But a moral code, grafts itself on to society, to religion, to people. 
So we have professional arts, and then we just have cultural society, religious arts, those are morals. But they're arts. We have code of conduct. What should we do? But they're not imperatives. Is that clear? Very simple scaffolding to understand this word ought. Because ethics dominates morality, for a lot of you, dominate your life. And so we, we live in this world of ought. And we're nowhere near natural law yet. We're still talking about ethics. So I want to talk about ethics for a moment because to do so is to help you place natural law in the proper context, and then we'll talk about what natural law is. Ethics, what we ought to do. C.S. Lewis has a brilliant piece in book one, chapter, book three, chapter one, where he uses a metaphor of ships. We're going to talk about a fleet of ships, and we're going to talk about three aspects. Now, I'm going to use his metaphor in a different way. If we're each a ship and going to sell out to some destination as a fleet, there are three aspects to this proposition. One, that we, the ship, are ship shape. That we can make the voyage. Yes. And that we know how to operate the ship. There's really two aspects of number one. That we are ship shape and that we can operate the ship. Number two. When we, sell, when we set sail, we don't want to bump into each other, which would be terrible. I mean, Titanic just ran into a cube of ice, and look what happened to that, right? So yeah, you don't want your ships to bump into each other. Number three, you have to know where your destination is. Got it? One, two, three. Ethics for the last 60 or 70 years has been focused on number two. Ethics, so if you read Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, the utilitarian stuff, or you read Immanuel Kant, the categorical imperative, you read this and whole classes and textbooks are built around this stuff and exercises. Watch carefully, look what's happening. They're telling you how to not bump into each other. Read them very carefully. Even the categorical imperative, which is cloaked in this idea of universality, is really something about not bumping into each other because that's where it's directed. Does that make sense to you? Even if you don't know these guys, that's the state of ethics today. And when are we going to talk about natural law? Well, now we're going to ease into it. Natural law ethics is not concerned about you bumping into each other because you won't if A, number one, you're ship shape and you know how to operate the ship. That's number one. And you know what your destination is because if you know those, you're not going to bump. Make sense? Natural law is about being ship shape and knowing your destination. That is what natural law is about. You can read about it. You'll get frustrated. I got into this precisely because I was on a board with lawyers and people lovingly invoked the natural law. But it became very clear that none of us knew what we were talking about. And that's OK, because always be aware of those words. And you know what they are. That you know what they are, but you just pray to God. No one's going to ever ask you to define them. Randomness, right? Mystery. Well, we've got a working definition, don't we, Nathan? Um, 
There's so many of them, aren't there? The natural law is one of those, so um, I thought maybe it would do well to see what this is all about. So, fortunately, we get, through divine revelation, all of the good stuff of Aristotle, Plato, St. Isidore, that Thomas puts it together. He gives us an article, a question on the natural law, which is considered among scholars, not because it's Thomas, as the best definition of the natural law. But that wouldn't help us if we stopped there because we need to go back to ship shape and destination. And that's what we're gonna talk about. What does it mean to be, and it's not just about ethics because that'll help us in ethics. That is life. You wanna be ship shape? You wanna know how to operate this being that's been entrusted to you? And you wanna do so to get to the proper destination. The bumping into each other is almost irrelevant once you're ship shape and know how to operate the ship. So let's talk about the natural law. When I was preparing this, I talked to my wife and she goes, well, that's easy. Um, it's the law written on your heart. And we all know this, we've heard it in liturgy. Well, most all of us have heard this, right? In St. Paul. So I thought I would do a quick search to see how often written on your heart is in the Holy Bible. And I found a hundred different passages. That's why you hear it so much. <laughs> um, but that's not helpful. I mean, don't misunderstand me. <laughs> The Bible is very profitable. Um, but that's not helpful in the immediate question, what is a natural law? Well, Thomas, we'll get a definition from Thomas. Thomas will tell you, and we can talk about this later, but Summa Theologica, first part of the second part, question 94. And this is how he does things. He gives you one question. He gives you 15 questions. This is just one, which might take 10 pages in here. He gives you 15 questions, over 100 pages, on the word habit. So Thomas is writing this. He's thinking, if you're going to read it, you're going to read the whole thing. How much time do you have? <laughs> right. So. Let's break it down to the six articles of the question on natural law. And it's confusing because they're called six questions. But it's question 94, so I'm going to break it down and call them articles. The natural law is God's law known by reason without divine revelation. When St. Paul says, written on your heart, or Jeremiah says, written on your heart, there you have it. It's something that you can know by reason, even without divine revelation. That's a natural law. It's God's law, but that of which you can know by reason. Not all of God's law can you know by reason. This is a subset. He makes it a little bit difficult because in Article 1, he talks about habits. And so he goes right from eternal law to habit. He asks, is natural law a habit? And the answer is emphatically, no. But it tends to become a habit. Should I read it for a third time? Or you got it? He, said, he answers this that we're given a summons where we possess our being unlike God and unlike the beast. We're in the business of becoming. And part of that becoming is developing those habits. The second article of natural law is to do good 
avoid evil. And I, one of my students asked me, well, what's good? Great question. But, but we're not going to worry about that right now. We're going to accept that because we could, once we start diving in, and I would love to, my wife would prefer I stay away right now. I think I didn't do my chores. <laughs> um, no, I, I made that up. Um, but I would love to get into all of that. But do good, avoid evil actually comes from the eternal law from question 93. And he immediately references it. So all this stuff is a seamless web and you just dive in somewhere. Article three, all virtues, this is the important one, all virtues are prescribed as in prescription by the natural law. The natural law suggests the virtues as the way of fulfilling your being. We'll come back to that. Final three articles. The natural law is universal. It's common to all people. It's common to everyone, whether Christian, whether religious, no matter whether baptized, not baptized, it's common to all. Number five, it's changeless. This is very important. In Islam, Allah can change his mind. It's changeless, absolutely changeless. You got that? It's for all eternity. Number six, it cannot be eradicated from human nature. You're endowed with it as a part of your being. You're stuck with it, whether you like it or not. You can resist it. Nature's going to be ugly to you, but it stays there. Thomas goes so far to say, is it in the damned? I remember, he's writing in the Middle Ages. But that pretty much sums it up. The answer is yes, which makes hell all the more intolerable because everything in hell resists what you are. So let's come back to number three. All virtues are prescribed by the natural law. My favorite author. You will never go wrong with this man. He's considered the greatest Thomistic philosopher of the 20th century. If you read the introduction of this book, you'll understand his greatness. In a short little essay that was translated in 1948 by a new fledgling journal out of Notre Dame called the Review of Politics, they grabbed Pieper's essay and they published it with the translation. It's copyright free. I think this translation's a little bit better. But it costs nine dollars, so it's question enough. But he's German and he's talking about theology. So when you have German or Italian, any of the Romance languages, you're talking about theology, things are gonna get lost in the translation. That's why the translation becomes extra important. Anyway, I highly recommend this book because if you read it, the Christian idea of the man is the natural law. All virtues are prescribed by the natural law. He's going to tell you what seven virtues make the man. And he grounds it all into mystic philosophy. The natural law that's in us is all the stuff to become what God calls us to. 
to live in his image. So what does this look like? You're going to think of virtues that I'm not going to mention. And we'll discuss them if you'd like. But I think you'll find that these virtues are all some combination of these seven. And some of you already know what the seven are. Right? He goes to great length to, in this book to talk about the four cardinal virtues. Now, I'm going to give you the short version of all the cardinal virtues. There's a medium version, and then there is the very, very good version. If you care enough about it, to know this through reason, do not ignore this book. Place it next to your Bible. OK, that's this is drama for trying to lighten up the mood. All right. Four cardinal virtues. Unlike the Greeks, the mother of all the cardinal virtues is prudence. Greeks didn't put it this way. They, they focus on justice and temperance. But Pieper makes an excellent argument that you'll find persuasive. Prudence is essential to understand justice, fortitude, and temperance. So what are the short versions? Prudence is to know what is true and, and to live your life accordingly, the free will. To, every time you sin, and you know it's a sin, you didn't do the second part. True? Yeah. So don't think, well, if I know it, I'm going to do it. Don't let your enthusiasm cause you pride. Prudence, to know what is true and to live within that truth. Coming full circle, he will tell you how to live within that truth in less than 40 pages. Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. They shall inherit. Don't you hate that when the, someone quizzes you on the edge? I, yeah, I know what they say, but <laughs> inherit the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Or the kingdom of God. Translations, you know. It will also talk about one of the greatest liturgical texts that we hear as Catholics. Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11. I'll leave it to you to look it up. You see it every month. And if you pray the office, you see it every week. And it's the part about where Jesus did not count himself equality with God, even though he was God. He didn't think of it as something to be grasped at. This author tells you exactly what that means. Prudence, to know what is true, and then to live according to it. Justice. The short definition, the very short one, is to give each person their proper due. Do you see why prudence is essential to be able to do that? Fortitude. To do what you ought to do even when you don't want to do it. And now we're starting to feel the ethical imperative fall on us. And temperance is just the other side of fortitude. To not do what you want to when you ought not do it. Sidebar. One of those that I go a little bit deeper to is fortitude, because today we live in a world where society actually insidiously strips away our courage through ways you don't even know, through rules, through bureaucracy through systems. We're guilty of it. Others are guilty of it. People love certainty, so they create artificial rules. And so fortitude is one that you feel pressed upon you every day. The others, um, where society's stripping it piece by piece in insidious ways where you don't even notice, and then suddenly you find yourself with a lack of fortitude. 
So I'm going to take you to the second level definition. Fortitude Thomas describes as the quiet perseverance of the good in a fallen world. Isn't that beautiful? Pause. Think about that. Fortitude. That encompasses the crusaders. That encompasses the survival instinct. I'm going to protect my family. It encompasses authentic heroism, not foolhardy, right? Courage. But authentic courage encompasses all of those. And that's why I recommend that book, because it can take you a lot deeper. And these are things you want to live by. Because if you finish the first book, The Idea of Man, you realize this is the whole of the summons. And it encompasses all the virtues. So I've given you the four virtues. What are the other three? You hear them every month, too, in the liturgy. Faith, hope, and love. And he gives you definitions of those. But I'm going to give you the short definitions. Faith is that which we owe to our past. That's your short definition. An atheist can accept that because they know they owe a debt to the past. We have more of which we owe to from the past. Hope looks forward. And hope is a virtue, and he, on the Christian idea of man, really hits it. And then love speaks for itself. And we always do well with the Thomas Thomistic definition of love, to will the good of the other for their sake. So we want an authentic definition of love. But if you get the four cardinal virtues, you know how to respect the past and use it for your benefit toward drawing closer to God and hope to understand the true love of the Old Testament and the New Testament and mercy, and then live your life according to the willing of the good of the other for their own, for their sake. This doesn't say being selfless. Thomas would be against that. Thomas would say you have a duty to love yourself, which people inadvertently set aside in their piety in pursuit of this. And that's one of the most dangerous things you can do. That leads to despair. This is the natural law. The business of becoming fully human. And we have a formula for it. To practice these seven virtues. Because that is our nature. And that's our law of our being. And this is what Thomas envisions. Now, you could ask me questions about natural law in the US Constitution. You could ask me about the law of this great Jewish professor who wrote a brilliant book. This is a big Catholic business seminar. People don't understand what contracts are. Contracts are the most remarkable thing in creation. No, they're not. Okay, They're one of the most remarkable faculties of human creation because it says, I can create a law that binds me to you by a promise, and in return, you bind yourself to me in a promise. Do you see how wonderful that is? We even have a clause in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, says that the government cannot impair the obligation of these contracts because we hold the promise and the self-binding as a good thing. Does that make sense to you? Do you see why that is part of our nature, too? It fits under the umbrella of love, although that sounds a little goofy, but it shouldn't. 
once we have the proper conception of love. And the only book I didn't talk about, I won't, but I would love to. That's my presentation. I would love to take your questions. This has been a production of the Leonine Institute for Catholic Social Teaching. Thanks for watching. For more information, visit leoinstitute.org.